before you do that, can oh, I? Yeah, we're broadcasting. <laughs> All right, click on broadcast. We're broadcasting on Zoom, so our attendees are going to roll in, and I'm going to um, go ahead and try once again for Facebook. And so, if there is something, um... I'm just going to share my screen so we have my title slide up. Sure. Yeah, that works. Nice. Hopefully, you can see that. It yes. does. It looks great. 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 Okay, and then Facebook. It says we're live streaming on Facebook. Let me see if that's actually true. I'm refreshing. Hey guys, for those of you rolling in, welcome. We're just getting our live feed going. We like to uh, share this on Facebook as well. So we're checking our settings there. Welcome, good morning. Are you seeing anything, Christy? I am not seeing anything. Okay. It just gives me the option to stop, so I will just try it again. <laughs> hey guys, welcome as you're joining us for Coffee at 10, our first one in 2021. So that's Happy exciting. Year. Yes, um, Gretchen, this is a webinar, so um, you will only see the panelists, which is Craig, Liz, and myself. And then you can ask questions in the chat. All right. I think we are, let's see, we're set there. Hopefully you guys have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Yep, I see it, Liz. All right, we're good. Okay, so we've got the chat. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We have a, a nice turnout we're expecting here on Zoom. So we're gonna see you here on Zoom and then also on Facebook. So we'll be monitoring our chat in the Zoom webinar, as well as our comments on our Facebook feed. So if you have questions as we move through our presentation today, please just feed them in there. Christy and I will keep an eye out and uh, see what questions you have, feed them into the conversation as we are able, okay? So welcome, my name is Liz Erlewine. I am our visual arts director here at Crooked Tree Arts Center. And with me today, I have my fabulous co-host, Christy Woda. Christy, you wanna say hi? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Christy's joining us from our Traverse City location. I'm here in Petoskey, Michigan. And um, this season, as we kick off our Coffee at 10 series, we were thinking about themes related to conservation, preservation. What do we hold? How do we keep it? Why do we keep it? All of these interesting ideas that we see through um, art and artifacts. And so to kick us off with this lecture series, we have a special guest, Craig Hadley, who we've been very fortunate to have uh, speak with us once before. Uh, Craig is joining us from the Denos Museum in Traverse City. And um, he has a great presentation that will tell us how to care for, for those things that, that we find that we are responsible for. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Craig. Um, take it away. Great, thanks so much. Thank you again, Liz and Christy for having me. Um, thanks to all of you uh, Crooked Tree members and friends out there for joining us. Uh, could be a few Denos folks in the audience as well, but in any event, welcome and uh, hope your new year is off to a great start. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of material today. I'm gonna try to cover a lot of ground. Feel free to uh, add questions. Do we have the Q&A function on in uh, Zoom? Yes, we, we do. We do. Yeah. Okay. So feel free, you know, uh, to send questions through Q&A. It's usually easier to track them than through the chat. Um, and then if Liz and Christy want to stop me at some point, if there are a lot of questions popping up, then I will address those as we go. Um, or you can save those till the end and I'll do my best to, to try to answer those. Um, but this is, you know, I've, I've run this session a couple of times, uh, different versions of the session before. I did teach an extended education class last fall that was a three-part series. So we met for three hours and we talked about, you know, two-dimensional object care, three-dimensional object care, and then generally 
um, how do objects deteriorate and what can we do to help preserve them from, you know, sort of the museum perspective. And we'd apply, you know, some of those tips and techniques to, uh, you know, a home setting. So how are you going to take care of things at home? This is a this is a really condensed version of that. And so I'll spend about maybe 40, 45 minutes going through the slide deck and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So a little bit about myself, you know, I've, I've been at the Denos for maybe a year, year and a half now. Um, previously, I was at DePaul University in Indiana for eight years. And before that, I was at Beloit College in Wisconsin. And so I have a background in care of paper and collections management. That's kind of where I started. And um, I also have quite a bit of experience working with digital um, photos and digital media and trying to preserve those and take care of them. So a little bit just about me here. Um, I also review grants for the Institute of Museum and Library Services and National Endowment for the Humanities. I run accreditation site reviews for the American Alliance of Museums uh, and do museum assessment site reviews. Uh, but what I'm not is, you know, I can't provide, you know, specific advice on taxes. I'm not a professional conservator or a restorer. And we'll talk a bit about the differences between those two. Um, you know, and I can't appraise fine art. We get those questions a lot. I'm sure the Crooked Tree staff gets it all the time too. Can you authenticate something? Can you evaluate it? Is it worth a lot of money? As museum gallery professionals, uh, that's a conflict of interest for us. So we, we refer you out um, to resources that, that I'll provide here today. A little bit about a few projects I've been involved in. So photo number one there is a Japanese uh, sword guard. That's an 18th century um, gold, copper, and brass uh, Japanese sword guard that would fit over a, a blade. And so when I was an undergraduate in college, I had an internship at the Field Museum in Chicago. And my job was to photograph these sword guards and then also work on translation uh, because I have a, a bit of a Japanese language background. So I did that. Uh, photo number two is from the Gemini Space Program. I, when I was in graduate school, did a, a lot of research on the Gemini Space Program capsules. Those were actually built and manufactured in St. Louis uh, for the space program in the 60s. So I did a lot of archival research. I scanned 35 millimeter slides, and then I actually met with the people that are in some of these photos. Uh, and I did oral history interviews and put an exhibit together uh, talking about their, their role in the space program. Uh, number three there is a catalog about Japanese modern prints. I did a lot of research on this topic, both at Beloit and DePauw, and still very interested in it and present on it from time to time. And fourth, uh, I've been on the board of the Association of Academic Museums and Galleries for about six years now. And so I work on best practices for college and university museums and share that information with our field. So that's a little bit about me. I'm gonna talk first about, uh, you know, these 10, what we refer to as the agents of deterioration, or now they're, um, you know, more commonly referred to as the agents of change. I think they wanted to sort of dampen down the language there. But for museum professionals, these are the 10 things that we worry about and they kind of keep us up at night when we think about our collections and how to take care of them. So I'm gonna walk through um, some of these different uh, elements and we're gonna talk about what we can do to mitigate damage, particularly for your collections at home. And then um, again, what some of those risks are. Uh, I'm also gonna step through uh, the different types of objects that we take care of in museums. I'm gonna step back here just for a minute and talk about these. Um, water is a pretty obvious <laughs> agent of deterioration. I think for most of us in museums, it's water pipes, leaks, um, you know, crooked tree staff, we're just talking about some, some water issues that they're fighting. Uh, it's, it's an unfortunate thing in museums and galleries, but you can imagine all the types of damage that can occur from water. Um, including not just destroying objects, but also mold and mildew, things that pop up after the fact. Uh, fire, again, is something that um, can be incredibly devastating for a collection just because it can um, obviously consume collections and destroy them. But a lot of people don't realize too that the smoke damage can actually be equally damaging if not more. And of course, if you have fire suppression in a building, now you have water thrown into the mix. So yeah, things can get pretty complicated pretty fast. 
Uh, light is something we constantly battle in museums and that's both visible light, so the light that you see, but then the spectrum of light that we don't see. So like ultraviolet radiation um, can be incredibly damaging to paintings and works on paper. So we have to do a lot in museums to try to mitigate or avoid uh, as much UV light exposure as possible. So when we think about light, um, I think what probably comes to mind is fading and you know that sort of thing, particularly if you think about rugs at home or works on paper that may change color. Temperature and humidity are closely linked to each other. So uh, temperature that's too high or too low can damage an object and humidity that's too high or too low can also damage an object. So think about a piece of wood or a sheet of paper that you might have at home. Uh, paper in the summer gets really, um, you know, it, it loses some of that, that tactfulness and it gets sort of uh, spongy feeling. And that's the paper, of course, absorbing water. And in the winter time, paper can feel really sharp and crisp uh, because it's just not holding a whole lot of water moisture. So we have to think about these objects, uh, both at home and in museums as being really organic and elastic and the way that they react to the environment that they're stored in. So, you know, attics and basements don't tend to be good places because they have high or low temperature and humidity, you know, pretty big extremes. Dissociation is simply, um, not knowing what an object is or losing some of that history or provenance. So all of us have the family photos at home with the names written on the back. And there's always a question mark over someone, you know, it's like, we don't know who this person is, that that would be dissociation. We don't know anything about that object or its story anymore. So what value is it to us if we don't, for example, know who the people are, we don't know where the object came from. Thieves and vandals is pretty self-explanatory, keep objects safe. Pests can you know, eat our collections, destroy them, um, particularly anything that's organic, made out of wood or textile, silk. Um, you, know, you think about mothballs around clothing, you know, all those things to try to protect uh, objects and keep pests away. And I think what surprises people most when they talk to us about museums and how we take care of things is number nine. So you would think that all these things on the list actually damage our collections quite a bit, but the number one cause of damage in our collections tends to be accidents. So I'm handling something, I drop it, I trip, it falls off the wall because it's not secured properly. It's actually physical force and accidents that accounts for the most damage in our museums. And finally, pollutants. So this could be airborne pollutants. Um, you know, oxid oxidation or, you know, chemical reactions where a bronze or silver, for example, could patina um, because of its exposure to um, elements in the air. And so what can we do to mitigate that kind of damage as well? There's, there's quite a bit we can do, and, and I'll talk about some of that throughout the presentation. All right, so I'm gonna run through a few different types of objects. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the risks, but I'm also gonna talk about how we take care of them and things that you can do at home. So number one, we're gonna talk about paper. I mean, this is a topic I probably know the most about and I'll, I'll be pretty forthcoming as we go through these different sections, what I, what I know best and what I probably know the least about. Um, but there are a lot of risks to paper. I've got some examples here that you can see. Photo number uh, six there that you see is a, a frontispiece to a, to a volume and you can, a bound volume. And you can see that there's some, um, you know, brown spotting on the paper there. And that's typically referred to as foxing um, by museum professionals. And so there's been a lot of research on this phenomena. There's not, you know, conservators are still trying to figure out exactly how this happens, but it, one line of thought is that it's um, the different sizing and materials that paper is composed of. And when you hit a certain relative humidity, uh, if you get too high on that relative humidity spectrum, then some of this reaction can occur. So foxing is incredibly hard to treat. The only thing that we can do as museum professionals is try to manage the relative humidity. Once this shows up though in an object, there really isn't much we can do to reverse it um, or take care of it. Uh, matting and framing, the way that we take care of our objects and present them actually can pose quite a bit of risk. If you look at image number eight there, 
uh, you see what's commonly referred to as mat burn. And so you can see an outline of where the window for the over mat was located and how the paper is discolored or the substrate is discolored outside the window opening. Um, that tells me that there was probably an acidic over mat. So the over mat board that was placed over this, this work was probably made out of a pretty low quality like wood pulp mat and it wasn't made out of cotton or 100% uh, rag. So that's something that we need to think about. Just because you mat and frame something doesn't mean that you're done. You do need to check in on those things and replace materials as they age. Number seven, uh, photo number seven there is a uh, self-portrait of Rembrandt with Saskia, dates to 1636. Uh, and that also hits on the glues, tapes, and adhesives that I have in the list. So um, that is rubber cement on the bottom half of the print. Somebody thought it was a good idea to glue this uh, etching to a sheet of cardboard. This is actually, I took this photo from when I worked at Beloit as a collections manager. And we sent this work uh, up to Minneapolis to the Minneapolis Institute of Art and they conserved it and removed it from board and couldn't get rid of all the glue, but they got rid of most of the discoloration. And then you see in the list there that things like fading and the oils from our fingers, you know, which can discolor work over time. Those are all things we have to look out for and um, try to avoid when we're handling paper. Some of the things you can do to take care of your papers, uh, really it's just the reverse of what I just presented, but right, throwing out old mats and frames and, and replacing those, uh, usually every 20 to 30 years, but it, again, it just depends on the quality of the material to begin with. Uh, we don't wanna fold or roll anything because that can put creases and, and permanent lines and damage in objects. Uh, in photo number nine here, you see what's called encapsulation. So this is a mylar sheeting. It's a uh, conservation grade uh, sort of plastic polyester sleeve. And what we do with uh, works on paper that are brittle is we'll place them in these plastic sleeves and then we don't have to directly touch the object. That helps keep all the pieces inside. We don't fold it or bend it. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to encapsulation. So those are easy materials you can buy uh, from museum suppliers to protect news clippings and photos. Uh, you want to avoid tapes and glues, pretty much anything uh, except what we call, um, it's typically referred to as Japanese uh, mulberry paper. It, it's, it's called rice paper by a lot of people. It's not made out of rice, it's made out of mulberry plants. Um, but mulberry paper is a, a common material that we use for conservation repair and for hinging. And then glues like wheat starch paste, um, filmoplast, which is a museum grade tape that we use uh, for hinging. Those are okay materials to use, but again, anytime we can avoid gluing anything, we, we try to do that. And then a few other common sense things, you know, avoiding excess light levels, keeping things away from food. If you're gonna handle something, wear gloves when you do it, and, um, you know, or at the very least, wash your hands before you, you handle something. So paper is a pretty complicated thing, but a lot of us have news clippings, we have photographs, we've got uh, works on paper, things that we're trying to take care of. Um, and there is a lot that you can do uh, if you just follow some of these best practices here. Uh, photos is another one that we, you know, a lot of us have at home. You know, my parents just shipped me two big boxes worth of photos and they said, oh, well, we're gonna send these to you at any way at some point and we're running out of space. Why don't you take care of them? So I, I got everything that you see, you know, on this, on this page here, you know, they sent me Polaroids, they sent me 35 millimeter slides. Um, I don't have any glass plate negatives, which is what number 12 is there. Uh, but, you know, I've got old turn of the century, you know, 1900, 1905 uh, family photos mounted on cardstock. You know, they're probably like a gelatin silver print or contact print that is mounted. So I've got to figure out at some point how to take care of all that stuff. Um, but not unlike, you know, not so dissimilar from works on paper, you know, photos require a similar amount of, of treatment and care. So the risks are, you know, more or less the same, right? We want to avoid high temperatures and humidities. We don't want to glue things down. Uh, folding, rolling is, is always a bad uh, situation. And then there are films out there like number 10 
you know, family Polaroids that do end up doing this. Um, you know, one, one quick story related to this, most, many colleges and museums received a large gift from the Andy Warhol Foundation in the 2000s. I, I've worked at three universities and colleges and all three have received a gift from the Warhol Foundation. And it's always the same. It's like 150 Polaroids and some gelatin silver prints and then some, some silk screen uh, prints. In fact, I have one in my office that I'm looking at. Um, but the thing with Polaroid is over time, you know, that, that film and the emulsion is pretty unstable. So depending on how the camera developed it and, you know, when it was manufactured and how it's been stored and all these things, uh, you may have a stack of Polaroids that look like number 10 there. Uh, the, the great irony with the Warhol Foundation gift is they gave all of our museums and colleges the stack of original Warhols, but eventually we're going to end up with a stack of um, faded or blank Polaroids. And they asked us to scan and digitize all of those before we accepted the gift. So they've got all the archival grade digital scans, uh, and we have the originals, but you know, what's more valuable, the image or the actual thing that's gonna fade at some point. So just a little something to think about there as you preserve things. Uh, you know, the best, best practice for us with photos is trying to transfer them to another format. So if you've got photos and you're worried about them fading or they're starting to deteriorate, uh, scanning tends to be one of your best options uh, as far as backup goes. So buying a decent flatbed scanner, or they even sell little devices, I, I've seen them online, where you can put in a stack of 35 millimeter slides and it will automatically scan those and put those slides for you uh, on the computer. The real trick there with scanning is, you know, the higher the, the resolution or the quality that you're scanning at, the, the more detail that you're gonna capture in that image. Uh, so it takes more time to scan at higher resolution, but you know, you may save yourself some work in the future or save someone else work if you, if you do it right the first time. The other thing too that I should caution with scanning or anything digital is you wanna be really cautious about the type of software and the file format that you choose. So if you're using something that's, um, you know, a special software or something that's proprietary, as opposed to using something that's more of a universal format, uh, you could get in trouble in five or 10 years and find that, oh, Apple doesn't make this software anymore, or you know, Adobe has discontinued something and I can't open my file anymore. I have a whole stack of Kodak photo CDs in the museum and I stuck them in my CD drive a couple weeks ago and I can't open them. It's in some file format that no modern computer can read. So how do I retrieve that data now from 1995? Um, that's something I have to do research on. So we could spend a whole session just talking about this, but the main takeaway is, you know, just do a little bit of research and think about what we can use uh, that could hopefully stand the test of time. I, I'll go back just for a second and say that the Library of Congress is the best resource for this. They are working on digitization efforts for digital media, like digital photos and, and Word documents and PDFs and they set the National Archive standards for digital files. So if you wanna know what Library of Congress is using, that's, you know, that's a great place to go because whatever they're using is probably a good choice um, for your stuff. And I've already touched on a lot of this here um, and, and I overlapped a bit with digital assets, but the other big thing to remember if it's anything digital is backing up material. I you know, had this sort of heartbreaking story, I think five or seven years ago when, um, you know, my wife and I had been married about 10 years and she was using my computer and something happened and I ended up losing a big chunk of files from um, the early 2000s. And she's still, she's like, I feel so horrible about that. But I said, you know, it's my fault because I didn't back that stuff up. I had all those documents and photos and things uh, just on my computer and I didn't have them on an external uh, backup media. So buying an external hard drive, you know, like I've got here, um, backing up online now, you know, using things like Dropbox or Microsoft OneDrive, anything like that, as long as you're making a secondary copy is always a good bet. 
I think where people get in trouble is they think, oh, I'm backing up the digital files and all the family photos on an external hard drive. And people move all that stuff off their computer and they think, oh, it's safe. It's on this hard drive. I put it in my little safe in the home and it's, it's okay. But the thing is, these still go bad and they fail. So don't ever rely on external hard drives to be, again, your only source of, of storage. I've had these die on me. I've had two or three in the past where I've either had to return them to the manufacturer or they do have what's called, you know, time before failure. They get so many hours and then the motors in them die. So uh, just again, something to think about avoiding the proprietary software. And, you know, if some new file format comes up and, you know, 10 years ago, no one was using Adobe PDFs, really 10, 15 years ago. Now, everybody uses it for everything. You know, you sign documents this way, you get things emailed to you. I just got my you know, tax statement from my health savings account through an Adobe PDF. At some point in the future, that file format may not exist anymore, or it may be replaced with something. So you have to also think about how do you move your files along so that you can still open them. If you wait too long to convert that Kodak photo CD, no one's going to make the software anymore to change it over. So that's, that's where I'm stuck right now. Paintings is a big one, of course. Um, you know, if you have art collections at home or if you're a painter yourself, you may be thinking about, you know, how do I maybe improve some of the works that I have or make them a little safer for someone who's buying it? Maybe you've inherited a painting or purchased something. And, you know, there are a lot of risks that come with traditional paintings. Although, again, this is a media that has really withstood the test of time. And we know a lot about how they react over time um, and what some of the damage, the dangers and um, things are that we can do to take care of them. So, you know, the first thing I'll say is, um, you know, paintings are resilient and they're tough, but they are fragile. And so I've seen a lot of paintings like photo number 19 here, where you do end up with a puncture or a tear. A lot of this happens either through, of course, the front or what we don't think about is the back side of the painting. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, there are keys in the corners on older frames that hold the tension on the, the stretcher and those keys can either come loose or fall out. And so I see a lot of historic frames where those are missing. The canvas goes slack or it doesn't have the right tension. And then you have other problems that start to pop up like um, flaking, popping, other types of things that start to warp on the canvas, cause tension, and then paint starts to flake or pop up. Uh, so it's important to kind of take care of tension and, and storage and all those things, because if you don't, then you can end up with secondary problems. I once uh, received a painting, this is when I was at DePaul, I received a series of maybe three or four paintings by a late 19th, early 20th century landscape painter. And the paintings were very, very yellow. Um, and I could smell them from probably 15, 20 feet away and they smelled like cigar smoke. And so I knew that of course the paintings had probably been in a home or an environment where you know cigar smoke was around them. That accelerates the yellowing. It's a pollutant, like we already talked about, an environmental pollutant. So you've got a lot of different agents of change going on there. Uh, and we had to send those out to the conservator for uh, cleaning. So again, there are things you can do to sort of mitigate some of those types of damages and high humidity. I mean, temperature, humidity come up on everything. But again, um, you know, if you're looking at something like a linen canvas or, or cotton or something, again, it's an organic material, humidity gets too high or if it gets wet. Um, I've had paintings where there's been, there have been leaks on the walls, the canvases get wet, and then you immediately start to worry about mold, right? So uh, those, are, those are things that we're typically concerned about. The last thing I didn't mention is uh, inherent vice. And so that is, uh, think about Jackson Pollock, right? Painting some of his famous paintings like on the ground, walking around splattering paint on them. Pollock did not prime his paintings typically. And so the problem there is that he's painting on a raw surface and just like painting at home, you wouldn't put drywall up and then just start painting your final coat on it. You would drywall a home and then you would prime it 
and then you would paint it if you're if you're doing it the right way. So a lot of artists, particularly contemporary artists, could be painting on masonite, cardboard, you know, all kinds of different materials, A, that aren't what we would consider like preservation grade, right? They're not, they're not uh, pH neutral. And on top of that, you know, there isn't a good priming layer. So in 10, 20 years, these things start to fall apart. So we refer to these objects really as ephemeral objects, right? It's gonna be really hard to preserve something made out of newspaper or toilet paper or something like that if it's been created using material that isn't designed to last, you know, 200 years. Some of the best things you can do if you've got paintings at home is, you know, avoid direct sunlight, don't hang it in front of a window because again, like a work on paper, fading and interaction with light, you know, visible light and UV will occur over time. It's probably gonna occur at a slower rate than like a work on paper, um, but over time it, it will happen. Uh, the second thing is look at photo number 21 there. That's a piece of um, pH neutral cardboard. It's called blue board. And we use that as a backer for paintings. And so if a painting only has a piece of that brown craft paper over the back, or if it has nothing at all, which is pretty common, we'll usually screw or mount a piece of either blue board or um, there's like an archival grade plastic sheeting called coroplast we will attach those to the back of a painting so that you can't punch through the back um, because that right there eliminates about half the risk from punctures and cuts. Then you just have to worry about the front. Uh, professional cleaning, that's something that museums don't typically engage in. We hire that out. Uh, so we're looking for a conservator who can strip that protective layer of varnish off uh, and then reapply a new layer. And a conservator should really only be working on that base layer or I should say the, the varnish layer, right? So if you've got a painting and let's say it's got some holes in it, it's missing some paint, it's turned yellow. The first thing a conservator is gonna do is they'll strip the top layer off the varnish. Then once they're down to the painting, they can evaluate it, take a look, then they'll re-varnish it. And if they need to do any sort of touch up, what a conservator should be doing is they'll be doing that touch up on top of the varnish. So they're not altering the original structure of the painting underneath. They're just working on that top, top clear layer so that a future conservator can come along and they can remove the work they've done. Um, and that's, that's really key in um, good quality conservation work. A conservator is also trained to know what kind of solvent to use to remove a varnish because there are so many different kinds of varnish that have been used in the past. Conservators have to know that balance between what will remove the varnish but not damage the paint. Um, and so that's all part of their training as chemists and as artists uh, in evaluating a work. And then uh, lastly, I have photo 20 here. You know, don't hang a painting over a fireplace. There are a lot of good reasons to not do that. But in this photo here, imagine that we're an active fireplace you have rapid changes in temperature, humidity, you have light, um, you know, you have airborne pollutants, like half the things on that list of, of agents of deterioration will happen if you've got a painting over a fireplace. So again, just some common sense things uh, to think about when placing an object. These are probably some of the more complex things that you might have to take care of, uh, you know, with family, family heirlooms, but think about composite objects for a minute or objects generally. Uh, my parents recently gave me my great grandmother's uh, Zenith radio. So I did some research on it. It's really cool, it still works. It's, you know, vacuum tube radio, uh, which is amazing. I mean, this thing is like 80 years old, but it's made out of Bakelite. So Bakelite is an early type of plastic, really popular in the, the early to mid 20th century. Um, you know, but we don't use Bakelite anymore, really, and it becomes brittle over time. You know, there are some, there are some issues with it there. So I look at that radio and I think, okay, I've got glass, I've got fiber, like this kind of mesh, you know, front to it. There are, um, there's plastic, there are all these different things that make up the object. So how do I take care of it? You know, and so I've got it in my home, I, I have it out so I can see it. 
but I don't have it in direct light. You know, the home is climate controlled in the sense of temperature and humidity. It's like, I've done everything I can for that object, you know, at this point. But you look at something like number 22 here, a, you know, Japanese folding screen, think about how complex that object is for just a second. You've got um, a wooden structure that holds it together. The hinges are typically made out of metal, um, usually brass uh, or you know, sometimes copper if they've been replaced. Uh, you have the actual sort of uh, silk or the paneling, the paper that's holding that panel together. And then you have images there that have been painted typically on Japanese mulberry paper, and then they've been glued onto that surface. So probably a wheat starch paste glue, which is really common with Japanese scrolls and, and screens. But right there, we've talked about a lot of different things that are all trying to live together. And as different environmental factors change, you know, temperature, humidity, light, it's affecting all those things differently. So at some point, you know, something may come out of balance and you'll notice problems. So that's when we typically have to take them to a conservator. I talk about objects in the sense of, you know, saving objects, but also knowing when objects um, aren't meant to be saved. And so thinking about ephemeral objects that are designed for a limited lifespan, and then they really do have to go. Um, here's an art installation that I worked on at one point uh, with an artist and no one's going to try to save this installation and put it in a museum. I mean, the installation on the left, the colored, uh, lines that's made out of tape and so it is site specific it's installed in a gallery it's made out of wood screws and tape um, you know I guess a museum could try to save it but I don't know how you would even go about doing that so then we think about different ways of trying to save uh, objects right so you could think about digital imaging maybe 3d imaging taking video you know lots of different ways we can think about again is the object the most important thing or was it that moment in time, that experience? Is it uh, the conversation we can have about this piece even though it doesn't exist anymore? Or is it that it still physically exists somewhere and we can go touch it and see it, you know, which is more important? And, you know, people will argue both sides, but I'll, I'll typically argue that, you know, it is the meaning, it's the story, it's the history, it's those types of things at the end of the day, if we only get to choose, that's what I would try to save. All right, so you've got something at home, it needs to be fixed, uh, you know, what do, what do we do? The first thing that we do, even as museum professionals, is we focus on what's called preventative care or preventative conservation. So we do everything in our power as museum professionals to do the right thing as stewards of objects. So that means, we're checking light, we're making sure that things are stored in the right sort of archival boxes and we're wearing gloves and we're doing all the things we should do to try to mitigate damage and reduce risk uh, in a museum setting. But let's say you have something that is damaged and you need to go get it fixed. You, you really have a couple options. I mean, you have three. You can try to do it yourself. Uh, and there are again, limited things that we can do. Secondly, you could seek out the services of a restorer. And so that's someone who's really trained to try to make something that's damaged look like it did originally. They may not necessarily have the level of scientific training that a conservator has. So when I talk about reversibility, I mean, that really is a conservator to number one sort of mantra when they do anything. It has to be 100% reversible, whatever they do. A restorer may not approach their job that way. They may look at it and go, the owner wants this to look like new. I will do whatever I need to do to make it look new. Whereas a conservator has spent years and years of extensive training um, and they have a really deep scientific, particularly chemistry-based background where they understand how different materials will affect each other chemically. And so that's really the key difference between the two. Restorers can have that kind of training as well. It's just they typically don't approach it with the same um, you know, level of intensity that a conservator is going to. 
I often get asked in these types of presentations and I throw it in here, I also talk about um, appraisal, gift giving and taxes because that's typically all wrapped into this conversation about how do I take care of something and oh, by the way, I have stuff but I don't know what to do with it. So often folks will say, well, how do museums and galleries and collecting institutions, like how do they decide what's gonna come into a museum and how do they say yes or no? And so what I have here is a pretty standard approach to how this works. This is how most collecting institutions operate. You know, they'll ask uh, a potential donor uh, to send them an inventory or photographs or some material so that, you know, the museum can start to take a look at it. They may also request an appraisal or appraisal documentation if that exists. Um, you know, then it's then really for the donor, it's going out and they're looking for different homes. You know, what are the appropriate types of collections or repositories where my collection of, um, you know, quilts might be best suited? And that's trying to find a good match with a museum whose mission matches the collection that you have so that you know it's going to be used and cared for appropriately. Uh, it's approaching that museum, sending them information. Uh, the museum typically has a collections committee, which is a body of staff, faculty, you know, experts in the community, whatever it is, and they will vet and evaluate proposals for the museum. They'll say, is this appropriate? Does it fit your mission? Can you store it? Do you have money to take care of it? Um, because gifts are incredibly expensive to maintain for an institution. Despite the fact that vast majority of museums would receive almost all of our collections through gift. We're not out buying collections. Think about all the staff time and resources that I've talked about here that would go into taking care of some of the things you see in this picture right here. You know, what if something happens to this giant whale bone carving here? I have to find a conservator. I have to transport it somehow to someone who's qualified to take care of it. And it's like going to the doctor, you know, you're not gonna get out of a doctor's office without spending at least a hundred dollars, like on a visit or something, you know? So going to a conservator is the same thing. I mean, getting an evaluation from them is a hundred dollars before they do anything. Uh, and, you know, typical treatment in over a decade that I've sent objects to conservators, you know, average bill is probably at least a thousand, if not two or three, to go and get professional help for something. So it's not an inexpensive thing. Finally, collections committee takes a look at proposals. They'll vote yes, no, maybe. Uh, and then you've got all the paperwork and formalities that take place. So that's, that's the typical process. If you've got objects at home and you're thinking, well, I don't really want to give it away. I'd rather sell it. It's a, it's a somewhat similar process, uh, except instead of researching museums, you're gonna be researching auction houses or consignment uh, operations, something to that effect, uh, and try to help find someone who you think could help you sell that object. Uh, shipping comes up a lot too. Folks ask me, you know, from a preservation perspective, I probably get a call once a month. Oh, I've got a painting, I live in Michigan, but I have a house in Florida very common up here. Uh, how do I get my painting in Traverse City to Michigan? And so I'll kind of walk them through the different options that we use at the museum. You can go to UPS store, you can go to FedEx or any of these things and you could use a shipper uh, and pack it appropriately. But if you've got something where you feel, uh, you know, this really isn't appropriate for like a common mail carrier, I, I really need more assurance or protection. You start to look into either freight companies that will send objects or, or things uh, via freight, like ground freight. So now you're getting into things like building a crate. Crate could be made out of wood, the crate could be made out of um, home insulation board. So you can go to a home store and buy, you know, that thick blue or pink insulation foam board. And we build crates out of that. So it's strong, but, but lightweight. Uh, and then the sort of top tier best option you can get is what's called an art handler or a shuttle. So that's someone who's going to come to your location. They're probably going to pack it. They're going to wear gloves. Your object is the only thing in this shuttle. They're going to drive it to its location, unload it, unpack it. They insure it. They do all of it. So that's where you're going to pay, you know, premium uh, fees to, to have that kind of service. But you know, if you've got that 
$50,000, $200,000 painting at home that's been in the family for a long time and you need to send it safely, you know, that, that's going to be your safest way to do it. And so finally, talk a little bit about uh, the appraisal process here. Uh, if you have objects at home or a collection and you're thinking, you know, for insurance purposes, or maybe I want to gift this, like I, like I talked about with museums, over $5,000, if you think your collection or objects uh, could exceed 5,000, then the IRS uh, requires a third party appraisal. I can't make a recommendation for an appraiser. Uh, Crooked Tree staff can't do that. But what we can do is we can, again, tell you what the process looks like, what appraisers do, and then I can point you toward resources. So I can say, you know, go to the ISA website and there's a search engine tool there. You put in your uh, zip code and then you check what kind of object you have. They'll have a drop down menu. You choose, I have a painting and it's American and I want an appraiser within 100 miles of Traverse City. And then it's gonna give you a list of qualified appraisers that you can contact and, and work with. And any more now, I should say, a lot of appraisal work can be done digitally. Um, so you don't even have to really drive the object anymore to the appraiser or they don't need to come to you. You can send them photos and you know, documentation, you know, certificates of authenticity, that kind of stuff. And they can establish value for you that way. Already talked about the taxes, but again, if, if a gift, a charitable non-cash gift is under $5,000, then you and your CPA get to fill out this form 8283 right here. And, you know, using your best judgment combined with, you know, a little bit of due diligence, you know, maybe you looked online and saw that objects like yours are selling for X amount of dollars, you can say, all right, you know, this is probably the fair market value. I can, I can establish that. But once we get over a certain dollar amount, then we again need to have that impartial third party appraiser step in. So that's, that's all I have for today. Happy to take questions. I've got a few resources up here on the screen. Uh, tons of things you can read about online. I'm happy to pass those along or you can email me for that. And then some of the suppliers we purchase from, you know, this is not like an endorsement or anything of their products. But again, these are pretty common suppliers in our field, Gaylord University products, Talus sells a lot, Light Impressions. You know, this is where a lot of us go and, and buy equipment and materials. Uh, Uline, I should say also too, sells quite a bit of material boxes and that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna stop there because I've talked for 45 minutes. I'm happy to take questions or um, I can just stop talking. Oh, no, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Craig. Sure, um, I think that was a great survey. We had a, a bunch of fantastic questions roll in while we went, but you had such great flow. I didn't want to interrupt. So um, do you want me to read the questions too, or you, do you see them there, Craig? Do you want to just go ahead and go down the line? Uh, I, I can jump in here and take a look here. So I'll, I'll just start at the top here. So David asks, you know, what are the primary risks of an organization like SeaTac, who has generally short term, so I guess this question's for you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> what are the primary risks of an organization like SeaTac, who has generally short term shows for potential damages, and or should we have some type of insurance? And of course, our objects are insured while they are in our care. Um, what we want to be concerned about in our exhibition spaces are the same types of concerns that Craig just mentioned in his presentation. So we acknowledge that the objects in our care are there for a short amount of time. Um, but just like Craig mentioned, um, we're still trying to mitigate. We're still trying to minimize the risk that's going to be exposed um, to these objects. Um, so while some of our exhibition spaces do not meet museum standards um, that we would expect to see in the Denos, these would be um, still goals that we're working towards achieving. And we're still trying to minimize how we handle um, and, and using gloves and our light exposure and our temperature and humidity control. So, so it's all still really relevant, Dave. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I think that comes up a lot. I mean, the only real difference right between our operations, uh, what typically defines a museum is we're collecting organizations, right? And so we maintain permanent collections. But at the end of the day, we're all striving for the same standards uh, and best practices. And the reality is, you know, no museum or gallery has a perfect environmental envelope. No one does. All of us have 
problems or issues that we're constantly trying to work around or find ways to improve operations. And that's just sort of part of the part of the practice. So great question. Uh, Meg here has a question about old photo albums with lines of glue. And uh, I can relate very personally to this because about, I don't know, five or six years ago, I helped my family dismantle, I don't know, 15 photo albums like this. Uh, so these are, what you're referring to is what's called a magnetic photo album. They're not actually using magnets, but for whatever reason, that was the name given to these sticky albums with the clear plastic that goes over them. And my mom had all these little captions that she had cut out and you know <laughs> stuck under them from the, the 80s and 70s. So the best way to try to remove those is, um, you know, pull up that plastic uh, protective layer on top, try to use a scalpel or something that could maybe loosen the images. If they're permanently stuck on there, I mean, if, if the scalpel is going to do damage or the, the razor blade, the only option you're really left with is either cutting the images out and then just remounting them into a new album. Or you could test this. I would choose one image that you really if it's destroyed, you don't care about it or digitize it first, right? But um, you could try low heat. So try a blow dryer on the lowest heat setting and just work very carefully and see if the heat might loosen that adhesive back up. Um, but, but as a do-it-yourself sort of project, that, that's really about all, all I can recommend. Let me know if there are um, other, other things you come up with though, I'd love to know. Uh, David here asks, is there a common language underneath all the tech in which one can store images that will remain accessible? And yeah, there, you know, right now in 2021, there, there are some very standard file formats for photos that we recommend for archival purposes. So if, if you were working in an archive today and that were, was your profession, that were your professional job, you would be making scans or photos in multiple different file formats. So you would start by doing a master scan and that master scan would usually be in TIFF format. So that's T-I-F-F. -F. That's an uncompressed file format. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the JPEG format. That's what our digital cameras on our phones capture in. That is a compressed file format. So it takes all the, that pixel data and it squeezes it down so that the file format size is really small. TIFF is basically the same kind of thing, but it's uncompressed. So someone at an archive would scan in TIFF, and then they would make a usable or a service file that would be in JPEG format. So that when you ask me for something, I can email you a three megabyte file and not like a hundred megabyte or 200 megabyte TIFF file. So working in those file formats is gonna be a pretty safe bet. Um, if, if you're going to be doing some scanning. Is anyone experimenting uh, with new coatings to protect classic artwork? And that's an, that's an interesting question, David. And I guess I'm not, I'm not quite sure, maybe by classic artwork, are you referring to like oil paintings and um, maybe like sculptures, marble or something? Uh, I'm sure somebody is experimenting with those types of things. I mean, there are conservation labs across this country, um, about a dozen or so connected to large museums. Very few museums actually have conservation staff um, in the country. Most labs have closed at this point because they're really expensive to run. But the Institute of Museum and Library Services does research on this. Library of Congress does, which was just posted. Um, and so, you know, there are a few labs in the country that do experiment, but um, not many, just because it's expensive and typically, <laughs> typically requires grant funding. Do I have a list? Uh, Meg here asks, do we have a list of oil painting conservators in Michigan? I, I do not have an extensive or comprehensive list of conservators, uh, but I can tell you that really your closest bets for professional conservation are going to be in the larger cities, right? So you're gonna to need to go down to Detroit. You're gonna to have to go to Ann Arbor. Chicago has the Conservation Center and a few other labs there. Indianapolis Museum of Art has a conservation lab, although it's typically not open to the public. Uh, if you do have Asian art collections, University of, 
of Michigan Museum of Art, UMA, has one of the best Asian art conservation labs in the country. A lot of people don't know that. But very few labs will touch Japanese, Chinese, Korean uh, scrolls or screens because it is so highly specialized. So what you're really looking for is you're looking for a conservator that specializes in a particular media. You know, I only work on American oil paintings or I only work on, um, you know, Japanese scrolls. That's it. Um, that's, that's typically your best bet. Uh, Barbara here asks, does hanging indoors on an outside wall affect a painting? And that's a really excellent question. Uh, it could. Depends on a lot of different factors, what kind of home you live in, how it's insulated, uh, right? Is it plaster? Is it drywall? Is it heavily insulated? Um, you know, what, what's the surface temperature of the wall? You know, all those types of things could come into play. If there's a lot of um, rapid temperature changes and there's very little insulation there on the wall, and you could simply just touch the wall, right, and see. Uh, then yeah, that could be affecting your painting and you might want to reconsider sort of an, an interior location where there's not going to be as rapid uh, fluctuation in temperature and humidity. And I should say it's, it's the rapid cycling in temperature and humidity where things spike up and down in like a 12 or 24 hour period. That's what we worry about. Gradual changes over time that are slow over days or weeks, that's not a big deal. But when we see temperatures spike like this over days or, or weeks, that's, that's a bad sign because it's causing a lot of stress on the object. Candace White asks, what's a good source for arch archival quality photo albums, tape pens, et cetera? Um, I, I would recommend suppliers like Gaylord, for example. They carry a lot of those types of materials. Um, also, you know, University products is another good source, I think, for some of those things. Big retailers, online retailers, for example, like Amazon could carry similar products or the same product. You just need to shop around and look. But if it were me, I would start my research on a museum supplier. Once you know the product that you want to use, then I would maybe go out and you could comparison shop. So Rita Miller asks, taking care of fabrics, weavings, quilts. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry. I, I missed uh, textiles, didn't I? Um, yeah, I can briefly talk about those. So like works on paper, really light sensitive. So you wanna avoid direct light or even high levels of indirect light. Uh, ultraviolet light can fade dyes and things again. So I didn't talk too much about UV, but if you have, old uh, quartz halogen light bulbs at home, anything that gives off really high levels of heat, or if you have fluorescent lights in your home, right? If you have a kitchen that has the big tube lights, those give off huge amounts of ultraviolet light. So that can actually be more damaging or just as damaging as direct sunlight. The next time you go in a doctor's office that has, you know, doctor's office art like posters on the wall, Almost every time you go in there and you look at the posters they have on the wall, they, they're faded. You know, the blues turn that light blue and browns turn light pink and all that stuff. And that's because the doctor's offices are using fluorescent tubes in the lights above. It's that cold light, really white, and that is fading the artwork. It's not the visible light, it's the, the UV. So if you have those in your home, you can do a couple of things. One, you can buy filters that go over the light bulbs and then they block all the UV out. It's really easy to do. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can upgrade those lamps to LED lights, which don't give out any um, ultraviolet light. So if you have LED lights at home or if you're using incandescent bulbs, you're good. But if you're using um, you know, anything like a fluorescent tube or light um, or those quartz halogen bulbs that are really small but really hot, those need to be filtered or replaced. Uh, finally, with textiles, um, if you're going to store them and you need to roll them or uh, pack them, before you fold a textile, you wanna pad them out. So you wanna take something like a archival grade tissue and you wanna make a bundle or a roll, and then you want to place the fold over that bundle 
so that you're not putting a, a hard crease in it, but you're providing a nice lip for it to, to drop over. And then you want to change out those folds maybe once a year, a couple times a year, so it doesn't become a crease. Uh, did, sorry. Yeah, you, just real quick, you guys, we are at 10.59. So I do want to just acknowledge everyone's time real quick. I think we maybe we can do one more, Craig. That would be sure. great if, if you're willing. Um, but really great questions, really great presentation. So uh, let's squeeze this last question in and, and see where we land. Sure. Yep. Yep. David Lawrence here. You've got, does Denos have a standard agreement they use to determine conditions of acceptance of a donated item? Uh, we do. So we complete what's called a condition report form. And then also on our uh, accession proposal forms, we have a whole checklist of things like, is the object stable? Is the object deteriorating? Do we have the resources to take care of it? Is it unique? And so we've got about 12 or 15 criteria that we check off. And then we use that also as kind of a rubric to discuss the object. So oh, great question. Okay, but the next one I feel like has such a broad apl uh, application. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It says glass on a photograph provides UV protection and physical protection, but traps humidity. Do you want to speak to that real quick? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's that's an that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, you have to you have to weigh that against the environment that you're in. Uh, so if you're in an environment where you're not concerned about physical damage, then sure, eliminating something like the glazing, the plexi, the glass. Uh, could be fine. If you have an object that is like a pastel or a chalky medium, uh, you, you definitely want that under glass, right, to protect that and, you know, even just smudging it or, or brushing against it could cause problems. The humidity issue with framed works is really only a problem if you're in a high humidity environment. So if you have something framed in your bathroom, for example, that's where I would get concerned because bugs are going to want to go in there and it's warm and it's, it's humid and then you get mold. But if it's in like the first floor of your home and you know you have air conditioning and heat, it, you'll be okay typically. So, good question. Super. Thanks. I'm to um, share with Liz and I that um, sheet, that last sheet you posted, it was a list of resources. You know, oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy to send that along and you can. Fantastic. And we can add that to our Facebook and um, the website. Yep. Well, sure. and we'll email it out to your crew. So, yeah, um, sounds super. great. Well, thanks right. again, Craig. Well, that was such a. Oh, oh sorry. So quick before everybody leaves, if you see Liz tomorrow, wish her a happy birthday. Oh. Happy birthday, Liz. Happy <laughs> birthday. Thanks, Christy. You're welcome. All right. um, super. Well, thanks again, Craig. Can't wait to have you back. Um, I think that was such a great primer. Uh, great start to our 2021. So thanks, everybody, for attending. And we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Happy birthday, Liz. You got some happy birthdays in there. <laughs>